All right, this will be the third video on um, Pavel Florinsky. Um, I really want to get to the uh, letter three or letter four, which is um, the Trinity. But in order to get there, we have to pull from some conceptual resources that were uh, ex explained and presented in letter two on doubt, uh, which is a pretty lengthy and technical treatise of the um, absurdity of self of the self-positing self of self-identity uh, rooted in rationality um, so before we get there the first letter is on two worlds and and um, Florensky goes through his childhood experience having a um, a profound sublime experience in nature um, where he saw kind of the visit the invisible world shine through the visible world um, and then later on how he uh, consummated that in his uh, his conversion to orthodoxy. I, I can I just broadly say that something that came to mind when I was reading that section is this this idea of the uh, the sacred. Uh, the sacred is where the the residue of the contact between the visible and the invisible, the material and the spiritual, leaves a mark. Right. So that which is sacred is where there is a surplus. There, where there is a remainder, where there is a mark left from the invisible world on the visible world. Um, we can think of that in, in many ways. Uh, one that came to mind was the birth of a child. If you've gone through childbirth, there's a certain quality to that moment in time that makes it holy in a weird sense. It's not, not exactly like church bells and, um, and, and bright lights, but there's, some, there's something holy about it. And that's where the, I think there's an experience of the, the mark left over, um, the sacred, the intersection, the convergence of the material and physical world or the material and the spiritual world, but a moment and it, uh, it kind of slips through your hands right when you articulate it best, right? Sorry about the weird pauses here, um, but I wanted to start and in, in dive into letter two on doubt, which um, Fl Florensky puts forth his um, deep dive into the idea of truth and ultimately the um, the consequence of this self-positing identity, which le leads ultimately to absurdity and to skepticism. And he has this term epoche, E-P-O-C-H-E. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, which is kind of the natural consequence of this idea of self-positing identity, the uh, law of identity as A equals A. Uh, he says that this, this given it ultimately does, has no ground to stand on because it it, it justifies itself on a um, unprovable uh, un, unprovable position, which eventually cuts its legs out from under itself. So um, it's a lot here and it's complicated. I'm going to try to get it through it quickly um, or uh, as as much as I can to get through to the uh, to the end here. So uh, bear with me here. So he starts it out, uh, he says, the pillar and ground of the truth. How can one recognize it? The question inevitably leads us to the domain of abstract knowledge. For theoretical thought, the pillar of truth, the pillar of the truth is certitude. So he, he treats this concept of certitude throughout uh, this section of the book. Um, and here he critiques this philosophical notion of truth uh, as the uh, all one existence. So he says, certitude measures, certitude assures me that the truth, if I have attained it, is in fact what I sought. But what did I seek? What did I mean by the word truth? In any case, I meant something so total that it contains everything and therefore something that its name expresses only by convention, partially, symbolically. The truth, according to the philosopher, is the quote unquote, all one existent. But then the word truth, does not cover its own proper content. And in order to disclose the meaning of the word truth, if only approximately, in view of a preliminary understanding of our search, we must see what aspects of this concept have been taken into consideration by different languages. So he's going to get into this uh, linguistic etymological exploration of the concept of truth. And he's going to look at it um, first in the Russian uh, word of estina, and then he's going to look at it also veritas in the Latin, uh, alithea in the Greek, and he also treats the, the Hebrew here. Um, and he takes the root of these linguistic conceptions of truth back to the Sanskrit roots, 
as well. So he has a, has a kind of a deep dive here. Um, so I'm going to give it a, a kind of a cursory overview here the best that I can. So the, and he, here's, a, here's a quote he has. So our Russian word for truth is istina, I-S-T-I-N-A. is linguistically close to the verb est, E-S-T. Hence, istina, according to the Russian understanding of it, embodies the concept of absolute reality. Istina is, quote-unquote, what is. The genuinely existent, do ondos on, do ondos on, in contradistinction to what is imaginary, unreal, unactual. In the word istina, the Russian language marks the ontological aspect of this idea. Therefore, istina signifies absolute self-identity and hence self-equality, exactness, genuineness. True, authentic, real. So more on istina here says, let us now turn to the etymology. Istina and its derivatives are related to EST to be essence uh, more with the polish uh, derivative estoit which means entity or really or to exist really ultimately it's that which is exact just that which is um, later on he talks about the sanskrit root here he says this ontologism and the russian understanding of the truth is strengthened and deepened for us if we consider the etymology of the verb est which is the root of this word estina, comes the root s, e s, which in Sanskrit gives a s, as, which can without difficulty be related to the old Slavic esmi, the Greek isme. So it goes on here. So ultimately breaks it down to the, uh, the root, the nuanced root of to breathe uh, in athmen, the breath of life, respiration or breath was always considered to be the main attribute and even the very essence of life. And even today, the usual answer to the question, is he alive, is, is he breathing? Whence the second more abstract meaning of est, he's alive, he has strength. Finally, est acquires its most abstract meaning, that of the verb that expresses existence. To breathe, to live, to be. These are the three layers in roots, that when the root s, in order of their decreasing concreteness, in order that, in the opinion of linguists, corresponds to their chronological order. The root as, A-S, signifies an existence as regular as breathing, in contrast to the root bu, B-H-U, which one finds in but, uh, signifying becoming. So we're seeing this juxtaposition between being and becoming. All right, he says, returning now to its Russian understanding, we can say that the truth, istina, is existence that abides, that which lives, living being, that which breathes, i.e. that which possesses the essential condition of life and existence. Truth as the living being par excellence. That is the conception that Russian people have of it. To be sure, it is not difficult to see that it is precisely this conception of the truth that forms the distinctive and original feature of Russian philosophy. All right, now we're going to get into um, etymological roots of Alithea. Alithia in Greek means truth. Uh, and it's interesting that this prefigures Heidegger's exploration of the term Alithea. Broadly, lithi, the root a, means negation of. Leth, lithi, lithia means um, forgetfulness hidden. So Alithea is an unconcealedness. Uh, the way he kind of uh, comes at it here. He says the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greek underscores a wholly other aspect of truth. Truth, he says, is alithea. But what is alithea? The word alithea, or in Ionian form, and he goes into all these etymological uh, groups here, which I'm not going to read. Um, let's see if I can just get to their um, kind of to the point. So this root lethe, right, also means I pass by, I slip away. I remain unnoticed, I remain unknown. In the medium voice, I let slip in memory. I lose for memory, a, a, acquires a sense of uh, memorial labor. It says, I forget. Connected with this later nuance of the root, lath or lethe, the Doric latha, and it goes through many other you know, roots of it, is compelling one to forget. Forgetting and therefore, lethargos, a summons to sleep. Uh, later on in this paragraph here, 
again, there's a lot here. I'm just trying to get uh, get through it as best I can. It says, to forget something and so forth, all this taken together testifies that forgetting for the Greek understanding was not merely a state of the absence of memory, but a special act of the annihilation of a part of the consciousness and extinguishing in the consciousness of a part of the reality of that which is forgotten. In other words, not a lack of memory, but the power of forgetting. This power of forgetting is the power of all devouring time. And a quick uh, paragraph on time in Alithea. It says, all is flux. Time is the form of existence of all that is, and to say, quote unquote, exists, is to say, quote unquote, in time. For time is the form of the flux of phenomena. Quote, all is in flux and moving and nothing abides, complained Heraclitus. Everything slips away from the consciousness, flows through the consciousness, is forgotten. Time, chronos, produces phenomena, but like its mythological image, chronos, it devours its children. The very essence of consciousness, of life, of any reality, is in their flux, i.e. in a certain metaphysical forgetting. The most original philosophy of our day, Henri Bergson's philosophy of time, is wholly built on this unquestionable truth, on the idea of the reality of time and its power. But despite all the unquestionableness of the latter, we cannot extinguish the demand for that which is not forgotten, for that which is not forgettable, for that which abides in the flux of time. It is this unforgettableness which is alithea, truth in the understanding of the Greeks is alithea, something capable of abiding in the flux of forgetfulness and the lithean currents of the sensuous world. It is something that overcomes time, something that, something that does not flow but is fixed, something eternally remembered. Truth is the eternal memory of some consciousness. Truth is value worthy and capable of eternal remembrance. Memory desires to stop movement. Memory desires to freeze the motion of fleeting phenomenon. Memory desires to place a dam in front of the flux of becoming. Thus, the unforgettable existence that is sought by consciousness, this alithea, is a fixed flux, an abiding flow, an immovable, oh, I'm sorry, an immobile vortex of being. The very striving to remember this, quote, will to unforgettableness surpasses the rational mind. But the latter desires this self-contradiction. If in its essence, the concept of memory transcends the rational mind, then memory taken in its highest measure, i.e. the truth, a fortiori transcends the rational mind. Memory, mnemosign, is the mother of the muses, the spiritual activities of mankind, the companions of Apollo, of spiritual creativity. Nevertheless, the ancient Greeks demand of truth the same quality that is indicative by scripture, for there is, for it is said that, quote, the truth of the Lord endureth forever, and that, quote, thy truth is unto all generations. All right, next he gets into veritas, the Latin root. I'm going to skip quite a bit here and just uh, plug into this, this quote. Thus, there is no doubt that the verb verirar, so the roots of ver veritas, which is used in classic Latin, in the more general, general sense of I am apprehensive of, I take care, I am afraid, I am terrified, I revere, I respect, I tremble with fear, originally referred to mystical dread and to the caution that was provoked by this dread when one came, when one came too close to holy beings, places, and objects. Taboo, the sacred, the holy, is what forces a man, vereri, which is again this root of veritas. Later on, he says, thus, strictly speaking, verar, this root, again, the veritas means, quote, the power of ritual consecration exerted over me. The power of ritual consecration exerted over me. Later, he goes into the, the Hebrew word for truth. The ancient Hebrews and the Semites in general captured in their language a special aspect of the idea of truth. The historical aspect, or more precisely, the theore theocratic aspect. Truth for them was always the word of God. For the Hebrew, the irrevoc irrevoc irrevocability, certainty, and reliability of this divine promise is what characterized it as truth, truth as reliability. Quote, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than from one title, from one tittle of the law to fail. 
The truth is, as it is represented in the Bible, is precisely this absolutely irrevocable and unalterable law. So for Hebrew, the truth is the law. All right, he goes into the root of the word amen here. Um, this, this word emet, which is the root of amen, corresponds to the Russian word istina, truth, in opposition to falsehood. Moving forward, derived from this latter nuance of the word emet is the term memes, memes M-E-A-M-E-S, which is used by Hebrew philosopher, philosophers, e.g. Um, Maimonides, quote, to describe people who, not being satisfied with authority and custom, strive for intellectual knowledge of truth. And a quick summary here of uh, what we just went over. The four nuances of the concept of truth observed by us can be combined in pair fashion in the following manner. The Russian istina and the Hebrew imet refer primarily to the divine content of the truth, while the Greek aletheia and the Latin veritas refer to its human form. On the other hand, the Russian and Greek terms have a philosophical character, while the Latin and Hebrew terms have a sociological character. By this, I mean that in the Russian and Greek understanding, truth has an immediate relation to every person, while for the Romans and the Hebrews, it is mediated by society. All that we have said about the division of the concept of the truth can be conveniently summarized um, in the following table. And he has a table that is not really uh, easy to summarize here. And this is we're going back to this idea of truth as certitude. Uh, and ultimately, the problem of certitude of truth um, is reducible to the problem of finding a criteria that justifies that certitude uh, in, the, in this sense. So he says, uh, what is truth? Pilate asked of the truth. See John 18, 38. He did not receive an answer. He did not receive an answer because the question was vain. The living answer stood before him, but Pilate did not see the truth's truthfulness. Let's suppose that the Lord answered the Roman procurator not only with this screaming silence, but also with the quiet words, I am the truth. But even then the questioner would have remained without an answer for he would not have known how to recognize the truth as truth, could not have been convinced of its genuineness. The knowledge that Pilate lacked, the knowledge that all of mankind lacks above all is knowledge of the conditions of certitude, lack of the knowledge of the conditions of certitude. What is certitude? It is the discovery of the proper character of truth, the recognition in truth of a certain feature that distinguishes it from untruth. Psychologically, this recognition is expressed as untroubled bliss, the satisfied thirst for truth. Yet shall ye shall know the truth, din alithean, and the truth, ye alithea, shall make you free. Free from what? free in general from sin, see John 8, 34. From every sin, free in the domain of knowledge, from everything that is untruthful, from everything that does not conform with the truth. So our certitude, says Archimandrite Serapian Mashkin, quote, is the feeling of truth. Certitude appears when we pronounce a necessary judgment and consists in the exclusion of the suspicion that the judgment pronounced will change sometime or somewhere. Certitude is therefore the intellectual feeling of accepting the judgment pronounced as a true one, close quote. By a criterion of truth, the same philosopher says in another work, quote, we mean the state of the truth-possessing spirit, a state of complete satisfaction, of joy, in which there is no doubt, whatever that that stated proposition conforms to genuine reality. This state is reached when a judgment about something satisfies a proposition called a measure of truth or its criterion. The problem of the certitude of truth is reducible to the problem of finding a criterion. The entire demonstrative force of a system is focused, as it were, in the answer to this problem of finding a criterion. Truth becomes my possession through an act of my judgment, but my judgment, I receive truth unto myself. Truth is truth is revealed to me by my affirmation of it. Truth as truth is revealed to me by my affirmation of it. Consequently, the following question arises. If I affirm something, by what do I guarantee for myself its truthfulness? I receive something into myself as truth, as a truth. 
but should I do this? Is not the very act of my judgment what removes me from the truth that I seek? In other words, what sign should I see in my judgment so as to be inwardly at peace? Every judgment is either through itself or through something else, i.e. it is given either directly or indirectly as a consequence of something else. It has in this something else its sufficient ground. If it is not given through itself or mediated by something else, it lacks all real content and rational form, i.e. it's not a judgment at all, but only sounds, vibrations of the air, nothing more. Thus, every judgment necessarily belongs to at least one of two classes. Let us now examine each of these classes separately. So there's a lot that um, I'm going to skip over here um, to get to this law of identity because it's important to understand the roots of the, of the problem ultimately is going to juxtapose here of the, uh, the privation of rationality with regards to reasonableness or reason, right? Rationality is a degrad degradative form of reasonableness where, um, in a sense, something like that. So he goes um, quickly, three kinds of self-evident um, self information, right? Uh, he says, this self-evidence can be, so these three ways of self-evidence, these kinds of self-evidence are sensuous experience, intellectual experience, and mystical experience. Um, so he goes into a definition of all three of these. We're not going to go into them. So he says, Later at the end, to question, where is the ground of our judgment of perception? All these criteria answer these three um, instances of self-evidence, right? Sensuous, intellectual, and mystical. All these criteria answer, quote, this ground lies in the fact that sensuous perception, intellectual apprehension, or mystical awareness is precisely this very same perception, apprehension, or awareness. But why is this precisely this and not something else? What does the reason of this self-identity of the immediately given consist in? It consists in the fact, it is said, that in general, every given is itself. Every A is A. Uh, and this is ultimately what he's going to uh, explicate and critique is this law of identity, right? A equals A. This is the final answer. But this tautological form, formula, this lifeless, thoughtless, and therefore meaningless equality, A equals A, is in fact only a generalization of the self-identity that is inherent in every given. But by no means is this formula an answer to the question why. In other words, this equality transfers our particular question from a single given to givenness in general. It displays our painful state of the moment on a gigantic scale, as if projecting it by a magic lantern upon the whole of being. If previously we had bumped against the stone, it is now announced to us that this is not an isolated stone, but a solid wall, a wall that encompasses the entire domain of our inquiring mind. I'm sorry, this is a little technical here, but I think we have to kind of slog through it. Um, continuing, A equals A, that says everything. It says, quote, knowledge is limited by conditional judgments or simply be silent, I tell you, close quote. Mechanically stopping up our mouth, this formula dooms us to abide in the finite and therefore in the accidental. This formula affirms in advance the separateness and egotistical isolation of the ultimate elements of being, thus rupturing all rational connection with them, between them. To the question why, or on what ground, it repeats sic et non altir alither, thus and not otherwise. Interrupting the questioner, but not being able to satisfy him or teach him self-limitation. Every philosophical construction of this type follows the paradigm of the following conversation I once had with an old female servant. What is the sun? He asks. It is our little sun. No, I mean, what is it? It is the sun, she says. But what does? It, but why does it shine? The sun is the sun. That is why it shines. It shines and shines. Look. See what the sun is like? But why? Good God, Pavel, as if I know. You're the educated and learned one. We're ignoramuses. It is self-evident that the criterion of givenness that is applied by the overwhelming majority of philosophical schools is one way or another cannot give certitude. From quote-unquote is, no matter how deep it lies in the nature or in my being or in the common root of the one and the other, 
it is impossible to extract quote unquote necessary. Furthermore, even if we did not notice this blind character of the naked tautology A equals A, even if we did not suffocate in this, quote, it is because it is, it is what it is, reality would force us to direct our mental gaze upon it. That which is accepted as the criterion of truth and virtue of its givenness turns out to be violated by reality from all sides. By strange irony, Precisely that criterion which seeks to base itself exclusively on its own factual lordship over everything, on the, right of, on the right of power over every actual intuition, is in fact violated by every factual, factual intuition. The law of identity which pretends to absolute universality turns out to have a place in nowhere at all. This law sees its right in its actual givenness. But every given actually rejects this law toto genre, violating it in both an order of space and an order of time. Everywhere and always. In excluding all other elements, every A is excluded by all of them. For if each of these elements is for A only not A, then A over against not A is only not not A. From the viewpoint of the law of identity, all being in desiring to affirm itself actually only destroys itself becoming a combination of elements, each of which is a, is a center of negations and only negations. I mean, this is the heart of the psychoanalytic uh, void at the heart of subjectivity, right? He's expl explicating this uh, beautifully way before, uh, you know, decades before it was ever um, really made popular in the West, at least. Thus, all being is a total negation, one great not. The law of identity is the spirit of death, emptiness, and nothingness. Once present givenness becomes the criterion, it is such absolutely everywhere and always. Therefore, all mutually exclusive A's as givens are true. Everything is true. But this annuls the power of the law of identity, for this law then turns out to contain an internal contradiction. And he goes on about this internal con contradiction. Um, ultimately, he's getting to the point of the solution to this problem, which is the fact, the infinite fact of the Trinity and the number three. And it's the very root of, uh, of a given, of our given experience, phenomenologically and theoretically. And it goes into the idea of space is constructed in three dimensions, right? So even if we can contemplate n-dimensional space, multiple uh, various uh, other dimensions, we still have our framework that we're left with of our three spatial dimensions. So this trinity of, of space, and there's also a trinity of time, right? The three integral categories of how we understand time to be is past, present, and future. So this trinitarian unity is woven in the very fabric of space and time, and also in the very fabric of our psyche and in our interpersonal relationships. Um, even he doesn't talk about this, obviously, but even the, the tripartite structure of, uh, the subject in Freud, right? We have the id, the ego, and the superego, right? So this trinity, this, this trinity, and he talks about this later, it cannot be deduced. It cannot be derived through argumentation. It is a given, which is experienced and can be, and can be experienced more fully. Um, but it is the solution to this absurdity at the heart of, this idea of the self-positing I, right, uh, which is the, you know, the modern and postmodern self. Ultimately, says rationality, um, you know, reasonable reason tramp, tr trumps rationality. Um, so I'm skipping quite a, quite ahead here. He says that which is rational is non-reasonable, non-conformable to the measure of reason. Reason is opposed to rationality, just as rationality is opposed to reason, for they have opposite demands. Life flowing and non-self-identical might be reasonable. It might be transparent for reason. We have not yet found out this to be the case. But precisely for this reason, life would be non-conformable with rationality, opposed to rationality. It would rip apart the limitedness of rationality. And rationality hostile to life would in turn rather seek to kill life than agree to receive life into itself. Thus, if the criterion of self-evidence is insufficient theoretically as something that stops the seeking of the spirit, 
it is also of no use practically since it cannot achieve its claim even within the limits it has set for itself. The immediate givenness of all three kinds of intuition, objective, subjective, and intersubjective or subjective objective, does not give certitude. This is a radical condemnation of all philosophical dogmatic systems. And we do not exclude Kant's system for which sensuousness and reason with all its functions are simple givens. And he goes into, uh, into Kant pretty heavily there. I'm going to skip here kind of towards the end. Uh, so I wrote my notes here. The roots of the hermeneutics of suspicion. And the roots, uh, again, in my words, this idea of epochi, E-P-O-C-H-E, um, is this, uh, this ultimately this self-positing uh, identity leads to absurdity and, the, and leads to uh, skepticism. And we live in the uh, skepticism cynicism. That's the ultimate uh, conclusion from this line of, of reasoning of the self-positing I, right? And um, the way out of this epochy, this, uh, I think another synonym would be ideology, right? Uh, idols, this ideology, this, um, this cynical, I even wrote gaslighting in my notes here, right, is, the, what, is what constitutes our existence. And he was writing 100 plus years ago, um, so it's more prevalent now. Right, so the sublime object of ideology, I think, is this uh, is 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 uh, close to the kin to this word epochy. See if I can skip to that uh, this place here. So he says we return to the intuition of the law of identity, but having exhausted the resources of realism and rationalism, we involuntarily turn to skepticism, i.e., to an examination, a critique. Of the self-evident judgment, right? So skepticism is this ultimate culmination of a critique of the self-evident judgment. As establishing the de facto inseparability of the subject and its predicate in consciousness, this judgment is assertoric. Assertoric. I don't know what that means. Um, a s s e r t o r i c. A link between the subject and the predicate exists, but it does not have to exist. There is, is, is as yet nothing in the character of this link that makes it apodictically necessary and irre irrevocable. The only thing that can establish such a link is proof. To prove is to show why we consider the predicate of a judgment apodictically linked with the subject. Not to accept anything without proof is not to admit any judgments except apodictic ones. The basic requirement of skepticism is to consider every unproved proposition uncertain, to reject absolutely any unproved presuppositions, however self-evident they may be. We already find this requirement clearly expressed in Plato and Aristotle. For Plato, even right opinion that cannot be confirmed by proof is not knowledge. For how could something unproved be knowledge? But neither can it be called lack of knowledge. For Aristotle, knowledge is nothing else but proved possession. Isis apodicti, whence comes the very term apodictic. It will be objected, however, that this latter proposition, i.e. the acceptance of only proved propositions and the sweeping away of everything unproved, is itself unproved. By introducing this proposition, does not the skeptic use the same sort of unproved presupposition as the one condemned when the dogmatist used it? No. It is only an analytical expression of the essential striving of the philosopher of his love of the truth. Love of the truth demands precisely truth, nothing else. The uncertain, the uncertain does not have to be sought for truth. It may be untruth, and therefore the lover of the truth must necessarily take care that he does not accept untruth under the guise of self-evidence. But precisely, this kind of doubtful character distinguishes self-evidence. Self-evidence is the obtuse primary thing which is not grounded further. And since self-evidence is unprovable, the philosopher falls into an aporia, into a difficult position. The only thing that he could accept is self-evidence, but it too he cannot accept. And not being able to state a certain judgment, he is fated to 
Epechian, E-P-A-C-H-E-I-N, to delay with the judgment, to refrain from judgment. Epochi, E-P-O-C-H-E, or epoch, or which is the state of refraining from all statement, is the last word of skepticism. So this term epochi uh, is, or the state of refraining from all statement is the last word of skepticism. Um, and now we're going to get into this idea of epochy in the soul. And I, I almost want to use the term ideology instead of epochy, but I don't know if that would be appropriate. Um, but I might anyways here. Um, so, all right. But what is epochy as a state? What is epochy as a state of the soul? It is ataraxy or imperturbability, the profound tranquility of the spirit which has refused all statements. The meekness and quietude about which the ancient skeptics, skeptics dreamt, or is it something else? Let's see. And further, does one who has decided on ataraxy really become peaceful and tranquil like Pyro? The same Pyro in whom skeptics of all ages have seen their own patron and almost a saint? Or is it that the enchanting image, this is where this idea of ideology, right, the sublime object of ideology came in, or even if you want to use the Lacanian derivative, small object A, or is it that the enchanting image of this great skeptic has its root not in the theoretical search for truth, but in something else, in something that skepticism has not succeeded in touching? Let us see. Expressed in words, epaki, or let's say ideology, comes down to the following two-part thesis. And I underline this as in terms of gaslighting, uh, right? So the two-part thesis is, I do not affirm anything, and I also do not affirm the fact that I do not affirm anything. This is the, uh, the logic of the skepticism here, this epochy. This two-part thesis is proved by a proposition established earlier, quote, every unproved proposition is uncertain, and the latter is the opposite side of love of the truth. If this is the case, I do not have any proved proposition. I do not affirm anything. But having just stated what I have stated, I must also remove this proposition for two, it is unproved. If we open the first half of the thesis, it will have the form of this two-part judgment. If this is the case, again, I do not have any proved proposition. I do not affirm anything. But having just stated what I have, just, what I have stated, I must also remove this proposition for it too is unproved. If we open up this first half of the thesis, it will have the form of the two-part judgment. I affirm that I do not affirm anything, and I do not affirm that I do not affirm anything. Now, as it turns out, we obviously violating the law of identity by stating contradictory predicates uh, about one and the same subject, about its affirmation, A, in the one and the same connection, but that is not all. Both parts of the thesis are an affirmation. The first is the affirmation of the affirmation, while the second is the affirmation of the non-affirmation. The same process is inevitably applied to each. Thus, we obtain these four propositions. A1, I affirm. A2, I do not affirm. A1, I affirm. A2, I do not affirm. In the same way, the process will go further and further. Each new link will double the number of mutually contradictory positions. The series goes toward infinity, and sooner or later, we are compelled to interrupt the process of doubling in order to fix in immobility, like a frozen grimace, this obvious violation of the law of identity. We then get a powerful contradiction, i.e., at the same time we get A is A and A is not A. Uh, which is, that's in a nutshell, right? The ultimate consequence of the self-positing I, or this givenness A equals A, is also joined by A is not A. So you see this this doubling down, this doubling back of this uh, this absurdity. And this made me think of uh, the pleasure principle and death drive, how they're connected in Freud. Um, this section here says, not being in a position to harmonize actively these two parts of one proposition, we are compelled passively to surrender to contradictions that rip apart the consciousness. In affirming one thing, we are compelled at the same time, at the same moment, to affirm the opposite. In affirming the latter, we at once turn to the former. In the same way that an object is accompanied by a shadow, every affirmation is accompanied by the exc excruciating desire for the opposite affirmation. There's a relation between the 
pleasure principle in the death drive. In the same way that an object is accompanied by a shadow, every affirmation is accompanied by the excruciating desire for the opposite affirmation. After having inwardly said yes to ourselves, we say no at the same moment. But the earlier no longs for yes, and this is desire in Lacan, like uh, right on, at least for my uh, for my reading right now, right? After having inwardly said yes to ourselves, this is the origin of the, the barred subject, we say no at the same moment, but the earlier no longs for a yes. Yes and no are inseparable. Doubt in the sense of uncertainty is far away. Absolute doubt has now begun. This is doubt as the total impossibility of affirming anything at all, even its own non-affirmation. Progressing stage by stage, manifesting the idea that inheres in the inuk, in the now, skepticism reaches its own negation, but cannot leap across this negation. There's the uh, uh, kind of money shot there, right? Progressing stage by stage, manifesting the idea that inheres, skepticism reaches its own negation, but it cannot leap across this negation. And so it becomes an infinitely excruciating torment, an agony of the spirit. To clarify this state, let us imagine a drowning man who is attempting to grab hold of a polished sheer cliff face. He claws at the cliff with his fingernails, loses hold, claws at it again, and crazed he catches it again and again. Or let us imagine a bear that attempts to push aside a log suspended in front, by a beehive, in front of a beehive. The farther he pushes the log, the more painful the return blow. The greater the inner fury, the sweeter the honey seems. The greater the inner fury, the sweeter the honey seems. That is a jouissance um, from my perspective, just straight up. Jouissance is this enjoyment this, that comes from this uh, pleasure and pain event that is what is psychologically covers up our, our void, our lack, that we continuously come back to. It's also this continuously coming back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and taking from the fruit over and over and over again. Um, trying to satiate uh, a desire says so the greater the inner fury the sweeter the honey seems the sweeter the honey seems such also is the state of the consistent skeptic what we see is not even affirmation and negation but insane convulsions a furious marching in place a tossing from side to side a kind of inarticulate philosophical howl the result is an abstention from judgment absolute epochy absolute ideology not as a tranquil and dispassionate refusal of judgment, but as a concealed inner pain, a pain that clenches its teeth and strains every nerve and muscle in an effort to not scream and not to let out a completely insane howl. To be sure, this is not ataraxy. No, this is not. This is the most furious of tortures, pulling, it, pulling at the hidden fibers of one's entire being. It is a pyronic Truly uh, pyronic fire, torment, molten lava flows in the veins and a dark flame penetrates the marrow of the bones. At the same time, the deadening cold of absolute solitude and perdition turns the consciousness into a block of ice. There are no words. There are not even any moans to moan. Out, if only into the air, a million torments. The tongue refuses to obey. As scripture says, quote, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. There is no help, no means to stop the torture, for the consuming fire of Prometheus comes from within. For the true focus of this fire agony is the very center of the philosopher, his I, which struggles to obtain non-conditional knowledge. I do not have truth, but the idea, but the idea of truth burns me. I love that. I do not have truth, but the idea of truth burns me. I do not have the evidence to affirm that there is truth in general and that I will attain this truth. By making such an affirmation, I would renounce the thirst for the absolute because I would, be, I would accept something unproved. Nevertheless, the idea of truth lives in me like a devouring fire, and the secret yearning to meet truth face to face makes my tongue cleave to my jaws. It is this yearning that seethes and bubbles in my veins like a flaming stream. If there were no hope, the torture too would cease. Consciousness would then return to philosophical philistinism, to the domain of the conditional. For this fiery hope in truth melts with its black flame every conditional truth, every uncertain proposition. It is also uncertain whether I yearn for truth. Perhaps that too only seems. 
Perhaps this very seeming is not seeming. And asking myself this last question, I enter into the last circle of the skeptical hell, into the place where the very meaning of words is lost. Words cease to be fixed. They fly out of their nests. Everything turns into everything else. Every word combination is completely equivalent to every other, and any word can change places with any other. Here the mind loses itself, is lost in a formless chaotic abyss. Here delirium and senselessness lurk. But this maximally skeptical doubt is possible only as an unsatiable equilibrium, unstable equilibrium as the limit of absolute dementia. For what is dementia but the meant ia or mindlessness, the experience of the non-substantiality, the non-supportedness of the mind. That's a zombie apocalypse all day. When this doubt is experienced, it is carefully hidden from others, and after being experienced, it is remembered with great reluctance. From the outside, it is almost impossible to understand what it is, what this is. Delirious chaos pours forth through the ultimate limit of reason, and the mind is deadened with an all-penetrating cold. Here, behind a thin barrier, spiritual death begins. Therefore, the state of ultimate skepticism is possible only for the blink of an eye, followed by the return to a fiery torment of pyro, to epochy, to ideology, or by the plunge into the pitch-black night of despair, whence there is no escape, and where the very first, very thirst of truth disappears. From the sublime to the ridiculous is a single step, and this is precisely a step that takes one away from the ground of reason. Thus, the way of skepticism also leads to nothing. So um, I'm going to skip here. Uh, it's going to get into the Trinity, which is a, kind of a response here. Actually, a little bit more here. More on the absurdity of the self-positing uh, I, self-positing subject. The self-proving subject Formally, we can affirm that this infinite unit explains everything, for to give an explanation of something is, first of all, to show how it does not contradict the law of identity, and secondly, to show how the givenness of the law of identity does not contradict the possibility of the grounding of this law. A new question arises, however. Let us suppose that the infinity of the series of grounds that is synthesized into a finite intuition has appeared in our perception as a kind of revelation. Let that be the case. But how precisely can this intuition form a basis for the law of identity with all its violations? First of all, how are the multiplicity of coexistence, disharmony, otherness, etc., and the multiplicity of succession, change, and motion possible? In other words, how is it that spatio-temporal multiplicity does not violate identity? It does not violate identity only if a multitude of elements is absolutely synthesized in the truth so that, quote, the other both in, order and co both in order of coexistence and in order of succession, is at the same time not other, subspecies aternatis. The if the heterototes, the, different, the differentness, the alienness of the other is only an expression and disclosure of the totots of the identity of this one. If, quote-unquote, another moment of time does not destroy and devour this moment, but is both another moment and this moment at the same time, if the new revealed as the new is the old and its eternity, if the inner structure of the eternal of this and the other of the new and the old in the real unity is such that this must appear outside the other and the old must appear before the new, if the other and the new is such not through itself, but through this and the old and this and the old is what it is not through itself, but through the other and the new. If, finally, each element of being is only a term of a substantial relationship, a relationship substance, then the law of identity, eternally violated, is eternally restored by its very violation. This last proposition at once gives an answer to the old question, how is it possible that every A is an A? In this case, from the very law of identity, there flows a spring that destroys identity. But this destruction of identity is also the power and force of the eternal restoration and renewal of identity. All right, so he goes through a whole bunch of this symbolic logic, which I'm going to skip to, um, and I have to cut uh, cut it short here. Um, but the answer in terms of Trinity uh, is at least introduced in this paragraph. He says, uh, um, The self-provenness and self-groundedness of the subject of the truth, I, is the relation to he through thou. 
That's it in a nutshell, right? Uh, this is the the identity through Trinity in a sense. The self-provenness and self-gravedness of the subject of the truth. I is the relationship is the relation to He through Thou. Through Thou, the subjective I becomes the objective He, and in the latter, I has its affirmation, its objectivity as I. He is I revealed. He is I revealed. The truth contemplates itself through itself in itself. But each moment of this absolute act is itself absolute, is itself truth. Truth is the contemplation of oneself through another in a third. Truth is the contemplation of oneself through another in a third, Father, Son, and Spirit. Such is the metaphysical definition of the essence of the self-proving subject, which is, as is evident, a substantial relationship. The subject of the truth is a relationship of the three, but this is a relationship that is a substance, a relationship substance. The subject of the truth is a relationship of three, and since a concrete relationship is, in general, a system of life acts, in this case, an infinite system of acts synthesized into a unit or an inf infinite unitary act, we can affirm that the usya, the essence of the truth, is the infinite act of the three in unity. The essence of the truth is the infinite act of the three in unity. Later we will explain this infinite act of life more concretely. This is what I want to get to, but we had to go through this. If you're still with me, God bless you, um, if this interests you. But what is each of the three in relation to the infinite act substance? What is real is not the same thing as the whole subject. And what is real is precisely the same thing as the whole subject. In view of the necessity of further discussion, we will call it a we will call it hypostasis, where it is not the same thing. Earlier we applied the term essence, usya, to designate it as precisely the same thing. The truth is therefore one essence with three hypostases. Not three essences, but one. Not one hypostasis, but three. But despite all this, hypostasis and essence are one and the same. Expressing myself somewhat imprecisely, I will say, quote, a hypostasis is an absolute person. But the question arises, what constitutes a person if not essence? And also, is essence given except in a person? Nevertheless, all of the foregoing establishes that there is not one hypostasis but three, although essence is concretely one. Therefore, numerically, there is one subject of the truth, not three. Quote, Our holy and blessed fathers, writes Abba Thalassius, recognize as trihypostatic the one substance of divinity, just as they confess the Holy Trinity as consubstantial. The unity, extending, according to them, to the Trinity, remains a unity, and the Trinity collecting itself into unity remains a Trinity, and this is miraculous. They thus preserve as immutable and unalterable the property of the hypostasis while preserving the commonality of the substance, i.e. divinity, as indivisible. We confess unity in trinity, and trinity in unity, divided indivisibly, and joined divisibly. But I will ask, but I will be asked, why are there precisely three hypostases? I speak of the number three as imminent to the truth, as inwardly inseparable from the truth. There cannot be a, there cannot be fewer than three, for only three hypostases eternally make one another what they eternally are. Only in the unity of three does each hypostasis receive an absolute receive an absolute affirmation which establishes this hypostasis as such outside the three there is not one there is no subject of the truth but more than three yes there can be more than three through the acceptance of new hypostasis into the interior of the life of the the of the three sorry it's interesting what came to mind here is the uh, the Taoist conception of creation and and metaphysics uh, Chinese medicine going back thousands of years is this trinity is the uh, it's called the, the three treasures the Jing the Qi and the Shen these three fundamental aspects of being ultimately manifest the 10,000 things which means just multiplicity so even in the Taoist uh, um, the Taoist and, and uh, metaphysics this this trinity that begats the multiplicity and this unity of the trinity um, which is the truth, which is the substance, which is the very givenness of a being, and it is miraculous. All right, just one more paragraph here, we'll finish. Um, so outside, outside the three, there is not one, 
Oh, it already went there. Here we go. But these new, but these new hypostases are not members which support the subject of the truth, and therefore they are not inwardly necessary for the subject's absoluteness. They are conditional hypostases which can be, but do not have to be, in the subject of the truth. Therefore, they cannot be called hypostases in the strict sense, and it is better to call them deified persons. But there is also another side which we have neglected up until now, but which later we will examine carefully. In the absolute unity of the three, there is no order, no sequence. In the three hypostases, each is immediately next to each, and the relationship of two can only be mediated by the third. Primacy is absolutely unthinkable among them. But every fourth hypostasis introduces in the relation to itself of the first three some order or other, thus through itself placing the hypostasis into an unequal activity in relation to itself as the fourth hypostasis. From this one sees that with the fourth hypostasis there begins a completely new essence, whereas the first three were of one essence. In other words, the trinity can be without a fourth hypostasis, whereas the fourth cannot be independent. This is the general meaning of the number three of the Trinity. And uh, this fourth hypostasis comes in as Sophia later on, um, which we'll get into. But I hope that was clear. Uh, I tried to be as clear as I try to condense about maybe 30, 40 pages of some complicated stuff to kind of give a general overview. Next, we'll get into this, the nitty gritty of the Trinity, uh, which I found just incredibly impactful and full of, of this of an insight that crashed on me, which I haven't been able to um, pick a part yet, or I don't even know if I can, but, um, anyways, if you're still with me now, uh, God bless. Thank you for tuning in. Let me know what you think. And, uh, I'll see you guys next time.